Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is uh, Miki Chaimovich. I'm VP of Business Development with RSAP Vision, a global leader in computer vision and deep learning. Uh, for this webinar, I will be hosting Moshe Zafran, our VP of Research and Development. Hey, Moshe. Hi, Miki. Good, Good afternoon. Hi, uh, and the topic of the day is in a heartbeat, uh, implementing AI in uh, cardiology. Uh, so what's on the menu for today? Uh, we'll start with a short introduction of RSAP Vision for those of you who don't know us. Uh, then we'll uh, touch upon AI and cardiology market trends, uh, really in a nutshell. Uh, the majority of the session will be dedicated to reviewing examples of implementing AI in cardiology. And then we'll uh, discuss the process uh, from algorithm to trials to medical device. And as usual, uh, we will uh, finish with our uh, Q&A session. Uh, so this is a good opportunity to ask you to send uh, to send us your questions, uh, the, the things you, uh, you know, the questions that came up so far and the questions that will come up during the, the webinar, uh, please do uh, share them with us uh, and we'll be happy to answer everything uh, at the end of the session. If there are any um, problems with uh, the sound or anything like that, please let us know. Uh, feel free to send us uh, messages uh, as well. Okay, so a few words about RSRP Vision. Uh, we are providing AI and deep learning solutions for image analysis. Uh, this is the only type of deep learning solutions we provide. We don't do NLP or genomics or anything like that. We stick to what we do best, which is image analysis or image processing or computer vision. There are a few words, a few terms for that. But in a nutshell, we can extract information from pretty much every type of uh, image. Uh, the solution is customized based on your project needs and your data set. Uh, this is important. I'll uh, talk about it at length later on, but uh, this industry is very far from standardization. So the chances that you'll find an off-the-shelf the shelf AI solution that uh, meets your needs are very, very slim. Uh, so we don't take that approach. We start with you, with your project needs, with the, the challenges that you're dealing with. Uh, and then we have a look at your uh, data set and we customize and tailor make a solution that is tailored to your project needs. Okay, sometimes you want to do things faster. Sometimes you want to do things more accurately. Sometimes you want to quantify things. Sometimes you want to do things in a more uh, cost-effective manner. Whatever your... Uh, exact project needs are, this would be uh, our focus. We've been doing that for many years. We've, uh, uh, we have over 25 years in, th in this field with multiple repeat clients in the USA. We, as a result, we have extensive experience in all AI and deep learning uh, techniques in numerous pharma and medical applications. Um, we have an experienced team of over 45 engineers uh, located in Tel Aviv, Silicon Valley, and Boston and as well as a medical team in staff to guide solution development, including radiology, pathology, and more. So the bottom line is, in case you plan to develop an AI solution, RSIP Vision is the safest, most stable way to do it. Uh, we have an experience in broad range of AI applications. I'm not going to linger over each and every one of them, uh, but I will say that as you can see, we've done uh, uh, CT, MRI, uh, uh, X-ray, uh, OCT. Uh, to the left, you can see pathology and microscopy slides. Uh, so we've really done most of those modalities uh, uh, that are common in the market, as well as we touched pretty much each and every organ uh, in the body. You can see lungs. You can see uh, heart, of course, which is the topic of the day, but also brain, bones, spine, and many, many other uh, things. Uh, I make a sure of emphasizing it uh, in each and every webinar, so I'll do it uh, uh, now as well. Uh, we are not a research center, okay? We make uh, real life solutions to people who make real life products uh, or to pharmaceutical companies who develop uh, drugs. Uh, but every once in a while, an academic uh, center uh, knocks on our door and we are happy to uh, cooperate. 
Um, let me tell you a little bit about the, the way we work. Uh, we start with a proof of concept. And again, the reason is that this industry is very far from standardization. So when you call me and you tell me, Mickey, listen, I need a, a solution for this process or that application, uh, I can't just tell you, okay, this is how much it's going to cost and it's going to take us uh, uh, three months or something like that, because it really all depends on your project. Uh, so we start with the proof of concept. The proof of concept does two things. The first thing is that it enables us to show you what the fuss is all about. Okay, before you need to make a commitment. Uh, and since AI is like a big buzzword that, you know, it's not always clear how, how, how we, it, this is relevant for us, we would like to show you pretty much how it will look like at the end, okay? So that's one thing. The other thing is that once we do the proof of concept, we get to know your project, we get to know your samples, and then we can uh, have a better estimation as to the uh, time of development and the cost, uh, cost associated with it. So it all starts when we sign a mutual NDA or CDA, okay, it makes everything much more comfortable. You can tell us about all the challenges and all the things that you want to, to solve. Then we define what parameters and deliverables are needed from the POC. Uh, these, by definition, would not be the parameters and deliverables of the complete solution, but rather something initial, but uh, good enough uh, in order to show you, uh, uh, to, get, to give an impression of how things will look like at the end. And then the customer provides annotated samples. Now, again, in uh, every webinar, we, we have these questions about this, the samples and the annotations. So I'll just say that for the proof of concept, you don't need many samples, okay, and a handful would do. Uh, and with regards to the annotations, uh, we can help you uh, both by providing you all kinds of annotations, uh, tools and by doing some of the annotations uh, ourselves. So even if you don't have a lot of samples uh, and you don't want to feel comfortable about annotating them, uh, it shouldn't stop you from uh, giving us a call or dropping us the line. Um, this process can take up to one month, it can take less, it all you know depends on how quickly we, we move forward. And once we do that, uh, we at RSIP start developing the POC level solution based on the samples that were provided. Uh, this is an iterative process, okay, uh, and it involves weekly discussions and updates regarding the solution development. Uh, again, this is something we do for you, so we really want you to be uh, uh, very much connected and very much uh, in line with uh, every uh, development. Uh, this could take a few weeks, uh, a month or two, sometimes less, sometimes a bit more, it really depends. Uh, and once uh, it's ready, then we present to you the POC solutions, okay, we present it to you, we present it to uh, the, the stakeholders and the executives and the decision makers within your organization, and uh, we provide you with a quotation. Once we get the green light, we define the fully developed solution, uh, and of course we at RSAP develop the solution. Again, it's an iterative process with weekly discussions and updates. Uh, all in all, this could take a few months, but not too many of those. So if you start the process tomorrow, uh, by the end of the year, uh, or maybe Q1 next year, you will have a customized AI solution up and running, uh, integrated into your uh, medical device or uh, f um, drug development uh, process. So that was about us. Now let's uh, uh, speak a little bit about uh, market trends. And for that, I, I will use uh, Signify uh, Research. Uh, for those of you who don't know Signify Research, they are a leading voice in healthcare and medical imaging technology. And among other things, they are closely tracking machine learning adoption in the industry. Uh, and late uh, last year, they've published uh, a white paper, a very uh, recommended one, if I may say so, uh, titled What's New for Machine Learning in a Medical Imaging? So uh, let's see what they said there. Uh, they said several things, but the, the thing that really caught my, uh, my attention uh, was titled No Vendor Can Do It Alone because this is really uh, something that we hear a lot uh, from our customers, from our prospects, from 
people we, we speak to that there is no vendor that can really provide them with everything that they need as part of their, uh, its own uh, products or its own services. Uh, and if you feel the same, uh, you know, it's very important to understand that this is not just you, uh, this is the market uh, sentiment. Uh, and I didn't copy it word for word, but I think you, this really sheds some light uh, on that uh, topic. And they say the following, with so many use cases for machine learning across numerous clinical applications and modalities, it's a daunting task for a single company to create potentially hundreds of uh, analytical tools. So most vendors offer a handful of AI-based solutions. And if you'll have a quick look at the market, you'll see that that is indeed the case. Uh, and if you're uh, using such uh, tools or, or if you're developing them, uh, you know that in many cases, that what you can do by yourself is really uh, limited and nothing that can really uh, meet all the, the needs. But uh, Signify Research also points uh, uh, the solution. Partnerships will be essential to create the end-to-end -end solutions that meet the needs. No company can do it alone. Strategic partnerships are king. Healthcare technology vendors need to collaborate with AI specialists to remain competitive. To that end, technology licensing partnerships are increasing. And they also add, these vendor-neutral ecosystems provide AI-based tools and applications from a variety of third-party software developers. And that, in a nutshell, is exactly what we do. Okay, we provide you with the technology, with the solution, because this is what we know how to do, and you just uh, use it as part of your medical device, uh, for, um, drug development process, or whatever else that you are doing. With regards to cardiology, the topic of the day, uh, they say the following. There is increasing use of non-invasive imaging techniques for a CAD, that is, of course, coronary artery uh, disease. Uh, this is driving demand for AI-based diagnostic tools. And that makes a lot of sense. You know, it's a growing problem. You need, uh, there are more and more people who need more and more uh, uh, checks. And if you don't have to cut them, you know, it's better, but on, but as a result, you have more and more scans and you have more and more visual data and you don't necessarily have the time and the means to make the most of it. And this is again where AI-based diagnostic tools uh, come into the picture. Um, with advanced machine learning techniques, they add the results can be obtained in seconds, the time per exam can be potentially reduced, and the results are repeatable and not prone to inter and intra observer variability. Um, we use slightly different terms uh, to describe what we do, but, but in essence, that's the same. There's a lot of uh, time saving in uh, AI tools, and um, I'm not going to linger over the intra and, uh, inter and intra observer variability, uh, we call it error uh, reduction, okay, because uh, it, we are all human, we are all making mistakes, and AI tools can uh, really help you to reduce, reduce those uh, mistakes. So that was a little bit about the market. Uh, and now, uh, without further ado, let's delve into the details. Let's have a look at all these uh, case studies and, and use cases and examples. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Moshe uh, to tell you a little bit about AI in cardiology. Moshe, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. My name is Moshe. I'm uh, leading R&D at RSA Division. Uh, I'm going to tell you about a few case studies, a few projects that uh, we've uh, uh, done and completed for our uh, medical device partners over the years. Uh, and then I want to speak a little bit also about our process. So how do we take uh, an algorithm or even a nice piece of software and uh, work with our uh, uh, partners to turn these, uh, uh, this software and this algorithm into uh, modules and into a part of an actual medical device. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, in this slide, uh, we can see an example of uh, one project uh, we developed for a client. So, the imaging modality here is... Uh, a cardiac uh, ultrasound, and the goal is to measure the left ventricle. Uh, so the ventricle is uh, uh, expanding and contracting, and uh, what uh, typically uh, the device manufacturer wants to do is measure the ejection fraction in order to quantify heart functioning. Uh, and in each and every frame uh, of the uh, ultrasound video, uh, our model uh, detects the edges of the left ventricle, 
obviously uh, this is uh, yeah here you, so here we can see uh, uh, typically uh, what these uh, uh, movies look like. Uh, obviously ultrasound is a pretty difficult type of modality. The images are very granular and uh, it's just a simple-minded edge detection won't work. And here we're using a combination of uh, image processing methods as well as a statistical shape modeling. So uh, we can uh, we use a fairly limited data set to model the statistics of this uh, shape of the left ventricle. We know it's a fairly smooth shape. We know how it typically varies uh, uh, in uh, different frames and in different uh, patients. And then this statistical information can be combined with the image information uh, to get a plausible shape uh, that can be used to make uh, measurements. Uh, now, uh, in the next slide, uh, we can see how uh, this type of technology can be taken, uh, I'd say, to the next uh, dimension or to the next level. Uh, so this project is a much more involved uh, uh, task. The goal is to, uh, to uh, do 3D reconstruction of the left atrium of the heart from uh, sparse point clouds. So here uh, we need to uh, we need to reconstruct a three-dimensional shape. The data is sometimes even sparser than the ultrasound data we saw before. Obviously, the way to describe the shape is a much more involved mathematical model. Uh, it was very uh, tailored to the anatomy of uh, this heart chamber, and uh, we did uh, specific uh, statistical research uh, to analyze how the shape varies across patients and created a mathematical model that can uh, uh, describe a very wide range of shapes that we actually see uh, in reality. Uh, and once this model is in place uh, and trained uh, on a, a, a suitable data set, uh, we're able to use it, as we can see in the next slide, uh, to reconstruct the shape uh, from both from noisy dense point clouds, as we can see in the upper left, as well as from sparse point clouds. So once we know how the shape behaves and we have a mathematical description of it and a statistical description of it, we can use it uh, to uh, uh, estimate and to reconstruct the shape of heart chambers, even if the amount of data we're actually sampling is fairly sparse. So if we did not know this was a heart chamber, uh, these uh, uh, this sparse set of points we see on the lower right uh, could basically describe almost anything. But because we have very good prior information and very good uh, statistics that we've learned about the shape and formulated uh, in a mathematical algorithm, we can uh, create the uh, reconstruction very successfully. And uh, this uh, uh, project is at a very advanced stage uh, in integrating it in a, a, a medical device uh, that's actually being tested in the field. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, the next slide is actually about uh, uh, the next step of this. Uh, so the uh, original solution is based on a, a statistical model uh, using a, a what's called a sort of classical uh, parametric modeling methods. Uh, and the next uh, step of here, which is ongoing research, is uh, moving this algorithm to uh, deep learning uh, to uh, methods these days as AI. Uh, this is a paper we've published together with our partner uh, in a Mikai affiliated uh, conference. And this is ongoing research. We expect deep learning. Uh, uh, to make uh, the algorithm much faster and to enable uh, training on uh, larger and larger data sets as well. Yeah, uh, this is an example of a completely different project. So uh, here the modality is fluoro. And uh, what we developed here for our client is a, a, an algorithm called quantitative coronary analysis. Uh, so there's a, a fluoro um, uh, a video of an angiography. There's contrast uh, agent being injected into the patient. And uh, using a, a sort of a classical image processing uh, methods, uh, we are able to measure uh, the width of the arteries uh, and uh, to segment them to measure the uh, abnormalities uh, and to measure the stenosis and to help uh, diagnose the patient in an automated and quantitative manner. Uh, now, again, uh, this is a sort of basic uh, uh, application. And yeah, in the next slide that Mickey just pulled up, uh, we can see a more modern application uh, uh, for a similar use case. So here the modality is a CT, and we, want, we need to uh, reconstruct the coronary arteries in 3D and to measure their uh, uh, diameters and their width at every uh, step of the way. Uh, this uh, uh, module is uh, actually a product that we are offering uh, today. And the way we did this was, again, a combination of uh, uh, classical uh, uh, computer vision methods, in this case based on graph theory, which we used uh, to quickly and uh, semi-automatically annotate the data set. Uh, so you, you have a classical algorithm, it uh, uh, does the segmentation pretty well, and then you have an annotator go and uh, correct it where the classical algorithm uh, uh, misses uh, to tweak it and to fine tune it on the data set. Uh, afterwards, the data set is used to train a neural network. And uh, once you do that, your neural network, uh, we find uh, that it uh, uh, 
uh, is fully automated. It does not require any user uh, 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 annotations or any user corrections, and it runs uh, modern uh, uh, GPUs much, much faster than the classical algorithm. Uh, so this uh, segmentation module is uh, one of the many segmentation modules that we're offering today. Again, the input is a CT, uh, and the output is the coronary artery uh, segmentation, as well as measurements uh, of the uh, width of the uh, arteries uh, uh, at every uh, step of the way. Yeah, so this is just uh, sums up uh, the project. And again, this is a typical project uh, uh, story. Uh, many times you start with a, a limited data set uh, and uh, you use uh, uh, classical and mathematical methods uh, to build an original, uh, an initial solution. And then at the next step, uh, you scale it up to bigger data uh, and uh, you're able to use uh, AI and neural networks to achieve a fully automated solution. Yeah, this is another example. So uh, as, a, as I think uh, we've seen already, we're not limited to uh, one specific modality. Uh, we've seen ultrasound, we've seen point clouds, we've seen CT. And uh, this is another example, uh, in this case, uh, segmentation of uh, the myocardium of the uh, uh, left uh, ventricle and the right uh, ventricle. And the modality here is uh, MRI. Uh, this also is done uh, using uh, deep learning, using a neural network. Uh, you can see a schematic of the architecture uh, on the lower right. Okay, so a few words about our process. Uh, so uh, we're in the business of developing algorithms. Uh, uh, I enjoy very much working with our teams. We got a lot of uh, uh, talented uh, people from various backgrounds, physics, computer science, etc. Uh, we're using uh, uh, like all available methods uh, in the field. Uh, many times uh, uh, these days it's deep learning, but also other algorithmic methods. Uh, and then uh, once we've uh, uh, achieved a proof of concept, and once we uh, get a, an algorithm that's uh, stable and that's robust and that's working uh, uh, fully uh, automatically, uh, there are still, uh, from the point of view of our partners, many steps uh, along the way to take this uh, algorithm, to take this nice uh, solution and uh, software and integrate it into their final medical device. Uh, and it is very important for us uh, not only to just uh, develop software and, uh, and uh, the modules, but also to uh, accompany and help our partners in this journey of uh, uh, going from algorithm to clinical trial to medical device. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, describe for you uh, in a few words uh, uh, some of the aspects of this process to give you an idea of how it works uh, when we go from proof of concept to in more advanced stages uh, of real production software. So uh, the first uh, step in this process uh, actually uh, starts uh, at a relatively early stage when we're still developing the algorithms or perhaps when we're uh, uh, scaling up the algorithms or making them more robust or when we're developing a fuller stack of software, uh, uh, GUI, etc. Uh, and here we use, uh, you know, best practices for so software development. So we have an issue management system. Uh, every feature is documented and prioritized, assigned to a team member. We do bug tracking. Uh, we integrate uh, the system with source control and uh, uh, we, uh, we interact uh, you know, transparently with our partners, with the medical device manufacturers, so they know what we're doing every week, what we've been achieved, and decide in an agile manner on the priorities together. It's also very important to use continuous integration. So uh, when you're adding features to the software or when you're tweaking an algorithm or improving it, it's very important to have automated tests running at every change so that uh, if somebody broke something, they find out about it right away because uh, uh, the automated test is running uh, just on their code. They don't really have to do anything. Uh, they can still continue uh, with their software development tasks. Uh, and this uh, enables us to catch uh, uh, regressions at an early stage. Uh, in addition to the continuous integration, uh, usually uh, during the software development process, uh, we get to a point where we start uh, giving orderly uh, releases to the uh, partner, to the uh, client who's developing the medical device. Uh, now, at this stage, uh, we're uh, releasing uh, whatever every few weeks or at some cadence uh, that's uh, uh, suitable for the project. Uh, and at this stage, we create a test plan. So, uh, first of all, uh, you don't necessarily want to automate every test you're doing uh, because at this stage, we're already looking at things uh, from the functional point of view, from the point of view of the user, and many in many cases, it uh, makes sense to develop uh, to define comprehensive manual tests for the functionality. So instead of writing an automated test 
for each and every uh, behavior of the software, and then you need to debug the tests themselves, etc. Uh, we have uh, we also use uh, manual test plans, uh, and we have testers, uh, uh, you know, uh, using uh, applying these plans uh, in preparation for each new software release. Uh, for every feature or code change or bug fix, even uh, we uh, uh, must define at least one new test that defines exactly what this change is supposed to do and how we verify that it's actually working. And we also add automated testing. So uh, this is an algorithm, it's not only software. Uh, uh, we also develop some automated way to measure the accuracy, uh, precision, recall, or uh, distance in millimeter, whatever metrics we're using for val validation, and to automate uh, the process of measuring uh, these results on some appropriate data set of cases. Uh, so uh, again, all this is going on uh, when we're moving the algorithms forward and uh, you know uh, making them uh, more and more production ready and uh, developing software. Uh, once uh, uh, we're we're advanced uh, in these stages of the process, uh, uh, the goal of both our partners and us are uh, making the software ready for clinical trial. So typically at that stage, uh, our partner, the device manufacturer, is going to do some verification validation process on their side. So uh, Maybe we have written the software, or most of it, we've written all the algorithm modules, uh, maybe we've wrapped them in some uh, user interface or some API, uh, and we know how to test that, but it's very important for the device manufacturer to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, implement an independent testing process from their point of view, and that should be centered on the clinical use case uh, uh, with which uh, they are always going to have uh, the uh, uh, even better familiarity because they're interacting with their uh, uh, users uh, who are actually the surgeons or the medical uh, practitioners. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, our device manufacturer uh, partner or a pharma partner or whatever is doing their verification and validation process. And we are interacting with them at every step of the way uh, in a, a very tight uh, sort of uh, talking to them at least once a week, if not more. Uh, we're getting feedback from them, implementing fixes and accompanying this process uh, by medical experts. Uh, and when moving the system uh, towards uh, uh, clinical trials, uh, obviously uh, there needs to be FDA uh, approval of the appropriate uh, uh, system, and the regulatory effort is typically led by the device manufacturer uh, themselves. However, uh, we will provide all the technical uh, documentation, a full description of the algorithm and the scientific background, the validation plan, validation results, statistical analyses of the validation results. We will define how this should be measured uh, statistically, if you like, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, produce reports so that you can show this uh, uh, to the FDA, integrate it in your regulatory uh, documentation, present results uh, graphically. Uh, we are very uh, uh, well versed in not only you know writing software, but also in communication about the software and about uh, uh, the use of that software uh, to our clients and to help them communicate with that uh, to the FDA and to their users. Uh, and support all aspects of, uh, of this uh, stage of the process. Yeah, uh, the next step uh, when moving actually to a production device, typically uh, the medical device manufacturer is going to take uh, the module or take uh, the new version of their device to an external evaluation. They want to collaborate with their end users and get feedback from them. Uh, and uh, also at this stage of the way, uh, we're still in the picture. We support uh, responding to all feedback coming uh, in from the field. Uh, continue to provide updated uh, software versions uh, using, uh, you know, the uh, uh, well, uh, uh, well established processes that I outlined in the, the previous slides, uh, both in the algorithmic uh, aspects, the software aspects, and also the usability aspects uh, and workflow. Uh, and then, of course, we're moving to production. Uh, the software needs to be uh, turned into a production uh, type software in terms of the documentation, in terms of integration, uh, uh, full technology transfer and handoff of the finished module. And even after that, continued support post handoff. So as Mickey uh, uh, mentioned, our company has been around for 25 years and you know uh, we, we plan to be around for the next 25 years as well. We're not going anywhere. So uh, we're always available and people have come back to us after uh, five or 10 years and said, yeah, you did this for us in uh, 2008 or 2006 uh, for 32-bit. We're moving to 64-bit. Please help us convert it. And uh, uh, we're always there uh, to continue supporting uh, our uh, customers for any of their future needs and their future feedback. 
Well, uh, thank you very much, Moshe, for this talk. Uh, it was very interesting. I think we saw many things, and uh, actually we did that uh, quite uh, quickly. Um, and we've reached our Q&A session. Uh, so please do send us your uh, questions. We're happy to answer each and every one of them. Uh, it could be about the things uh, we've just shown you. It could be uh, something uh, different. Uh, whatever you want to ask, uh, we're here. Uh, so please do uh, send your questions. Uh, let me see what we're being asked today. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, well, one question here, can you comment on the rate of both positive and negative detections by the stenosis detection algorithm you have developed? Any data? What do we say to that, Moshe? Yeah, so uh, for the QCA, uh, basically the user um, provides uh, as input uh, uh, two clicks typically at the beginning and the end of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the artery that they want to measure. And uh, the results are, uh, are more or less perfect there. I mean, if, if you can see with your eye the stenosis and you would measure it yourself, uh, the algorithm uh, in basically uh, perfectly, you always see that we find a uh, order. I don't really think there are any errors there. It's uh, uh, rather straightforward. I understand. Okay, let's see what else, what else. Uh, not too many questions today. Come on, guys. If you have any questions, that, uh, that's the time. Uh, we're here for you. So please don't be shy and uh, send your questions. Let me see. Okay. Um, well, this is something we pretty much touched upon, so I'll, I'll skip it. Um, mm -mm. Okay, it's about the modalities. Uh, can you really implement AI uh, with every modality? Uh, Moshe, what do we say to that? Well, more or less, yes. Yeah. So again, as a company, uh, we don't do uh, NLP. You know, if you need to, uh, to do some uh, text processing of the medical records, etc., that's not really uh, our uh, focus. We focus on uh, what we call images. But an image is uh, uh, an image can be uh, a very wide definition. So a point cloud is also an image from our point of view. Uh, and uh, basically, any uh, interesting two or three uh, or more dimensional data is a game as far as we're concerned. Of course, you know the results that you can expect and the amount of data you're going to need and the technology you're going to use uh, very much depends on the modality. Very much depends on the quality of data you're getting. From your imaging system uh, and the at this on the specific challenges of uh, whatever task you are uh, undertaking. Excellent, thank you, Moshe. I'll just add to that uh, for those of you you know who are not necessarily on the technical side. Uh, as a rule of thumb, whatever a person can see, uh, we can handle. Okay, if it's not there on the image, then of course we we can't handle it. But if it's there and if a person can see it, uh, we can deal with that. Uh, and uh, one of the benefits, one of the things that uh, you know the AI solution does much better than the person is uh, the quantification. Okay, because if you take a look, uh, I don't know, outside your window, let's say you're in New York, and uh, I tell you, do you see all those windows of all these many buildings out there? Then the answer would be yes. Okay, but if I ask you to count them, then this is next to impossible. Even if, even though you can see each and every thing, each and every window, uh, you you don't have what it takes in order to count them without getting mixed up. And and have I counted this uh, and not that, and so on and so forth. Um, so the the one of the key benefits of AI tools is that not only uh, we can see whatever a person can see, but we're much better at uh, counting it. Okay, so this is a this is a very important thing. And many people uh, when they approach us. It's even though they, they feel quite comfortable with their ability to, to detect or segment or classify all kinds of uh, uh, findings on the, on the image. Uh, but uh, with regards to quantification, uh, this is where they really feel or this is where it's really natural for them to understand that the, um, that the software can do a, a better job than a, than a human. Um, 
Okay, uh, a few more questions. Good guys, you you started sending your questions. Um, let's see. Um, the ultrasound image was going in and out of, of plane. How does that affect your volume measurements? Moshe? Yeah, so uh, in that uh, specific module, we're, we're approximating the volume, but we're really uh, measuring the area uh, in a specific plane. So in any case, it's just an approximation of the volume. And uh, yeah, the more you're going in and out of plane, obviously it's going to affect uh, 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 the accuracy of what uh, you're trying to measure. Um, so. Okay. Um, how are IP-related matters uh, handled? Okay, I, I can take this one. Uh, be, uh, it's, it's actually very simple, okay? Um, we make it for you, which basically means that the solution is yours, okay? We make the solution for you, you implement it into your medical device or, uh, you know, uh, pharma and drug development process, or whatever you need, um, and, and it becomes yours. Okay, we don't get royalties or anything like that. You just uh, uh, pay us for the project, uh, and 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 that's it. Everything uh, beyond that is yours. Uh, the only thing you can't do is sell our solution as a standalone. Okay, so if it's integrated uh, to your device, then you can sell uh, you know as many of of these as as, as you want, and th this is not relevant uh, uh, to us. Okay, but what you can do is take the you know the AI solution that we've built for you and tell people, okay, guys, I have an AI solution for this and that. Okay, but this is of course a very rare scenario. This is not something that you know you're looking for. Uh, so aside from from that, uh, the entire IP and all the royalties and everything uh, uh, to do about it is uh, is yours. I hope that uh, answers the question. Um, let's see what else do we have here. Uh, how far outside of images do you go? Uh, electrogram signal interpretation. Uh, Moshe, uh, do you do you have anything to say about that? Actually, actually, in the field of cardiology, we uh, have done a project uh, in uh, modeling electrical symbols, uh, signals, excuse me, on uh, heart chambers from sparse data. It's sort of a distant cousin of the uh, geometrical uh, shape representation project I showed you. Uh, so typically, uh, as I mentioned before, if if the data is uh, two-dimensional, three-dimensional data, uh, then from our point of view, uh, we can think of it as an image. We don't do like real hardcore signal processing uh, type of projects, uh, which are typically like one dimensional signals, but uh, uh, it doesn't have to be a picture that's acquired by a camera or even by a screen. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question, does technology transfer imply that they provide the client with the full source code? Uh, well, yes, we definitely provide the client with the full source code. Uh, yes, this is your solution. We're developing it for you, uh, but this is your solution and you get the, the source code. Uh, what expertise do you have in terms of data augmentation to train AI models with sparse amounts of labeled data? Uh, Moshe, this is uh, your side of things. Yeah, we, we almost always use uh, data augmentation uh, when we train uh, AI models. So. Uh, Ranges from you know standard uh, data augmentations to play with the colors, to add noise, to do uh, you know small uh, uh, geometric def deformations, uh, whether they're global or or local or elastic, etc. Uh, that's that's you know uh, where it starts from. Uh, and then usually we also find uh, find it uh, valuable to uh, do more creative type of augmentations. So uh, depending on the uh, use case, depending on the project, if we see that there's some aspect of the data that's rich and some aspect of the data uh, that's poorer or uh, sparser or in a, a shorter supply. Uh, we can do all kinds of uh, merging of uh, various types of data to create new artificial examples. So uh, uh, data augmentation is in general a, a very important part of the process of developing uh, the best practices for a, a deep learning solution for a particular application. It's a big part of, uh, of what the teams are, uh, are working on. 
uh, and uh, it's a very interesting part of their work actually because you need to look at the results and uh, you know use your intuition use your understanding of what you're looking at uh, to understand uh, how to uh, debug the neural network how to teach it uh, to uh, get uh, good results in cases where it's uh, uh, still being computed. Excellent. Um, any more questions? Please send them over. Any more questions? Mm -mm -mm, let's see. Nope. Nope. Okay. So uh, if there are no more questions, uh, I'll just say uh, thank you very much for attending. Uh, thank you very much, Moshe, for the talk. Um, and please do stay tuned for our next uh, webinars. Okay, we have them every uh, week, uh, every two weeks or three weeks. Uh, our next webinar uh, will be dealing with, uh, will be focused on uh, uh, pharma, and we'll discuss the, the the do's and don'ts you need to do when you uh, implement uh, uh, AI uh, uh, into your uh, processes. Uh, so those of you who, are, who, are, who have interest in that, uh, please do join us. Um, we will notify you uh, either by uh, email or by uh, posts on LinkedIn. Uh, if you want us to uh, notify you regularly, please don't hesitate to contact us and ask. You know, we'll be happy to add you to the to the email list. Um, and again, if there are ah, one one one, okay. And again, um, thank you very much for uh, attending. If you have any additional questions, uh, please, uh, uh, we'll take them uh, offline. Uh, and I'll see you next time. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Moshe. Thank you, Vicky. Thanks, everyone, for attending.